Hey everybody, welcome into another message from Journey Church in Westerville. I'm Pastor Chris, and I'm so glad you've jumped into this message today. Now today's message is going to be unlike most of the messages I teach. Uh, I am just back in from being camp pastor for a week at uh, Paintball Camp. Uh, we had chapel every evening, so I did quite a bit of preaching during the last week, but we had some great stories uh, from camp where young lives were challenged and lives were changed forever by the gospel of Christ. Uh, but I'm not going to go into all that because that would be three or four messages long. But I do want to thank you for jumping in today. And I want to tell you, as we continue through our series in the book of Romans, uh, today we're in Romans chapter 4, verses 9 through 25. So if you have a Bible, get that ready. And uh, what I'm going to do is, is read through this tell you what the main points are, and then illustrate it with some of the passages that we covered at camp this week. Uh, we were looking at the miracles of Jesus uh, this last week. We we're doing that in the book of Mark. And so if, if you're in Romans chapter 4, you may want to make a little tab back into Mark chapter 2. I'm going to share with you a little bit of a story from Mark chapter 2, Mark 4, and Mark 5 to illustrate uh, what Paul is saying here. Now, as we've been going through Romans, uh, I want to tell you all the messages, including this one, stand alone. Uh, this one being kind of unique in its uh, flavor. But um, they're all available if you want to watch some of the other ones in this series through our website. Our website is journeywesterville.org. It's journeywesterville.org. And you'll find there links to our Rumble channel, to our Facebook page, to our YouTube channel. All of those contain all of our teachings through this uh, book, uh, through First, Second Thessalonians, any other, past, any other books of the Bible that we've covered, you'll find there. I am a Bible teacher. Uh, that's what I've done. It's what I got to do this week um, at, at paintball camp. It's what I'm going to do here. And uh, Paul, just to give you a quick background of Romans, Paul is writing a welcome letter uh, for his friend Phoebe uh, to the church in Rome. Now, this is a church, even though Paul is getting older and he's on his third missionary journey, he's writing from Corinth. Uh, this is a church at Rome is a church he's never been to. And he badly wants to go there because the reality is all roads really do lead through Rome at this time in the world. Uh, it is kind of the, the most important center uh, in all of the world. Thousands of people are coming in and out of Rome uh, to go to other cities, states, and countries around the world every day. And, and Paul wants to go there to share, of course, the gospel of, of Christ so that people all around the world could be saved. That's always his passion. Now, as Paul is writing this, he is writing this uh, realizing that, that there probably is going to be some conflict between some of the Jews coming back to Jerusalem after being kicked out. Uh, they're being allowed back in now, some of the Jewish believers uh, and, and some of the Gentile believers in this local church. And, and he really wants them to have that one foundation in Christ. Uh, as he's writing uh, through Romans, uh, he starts off talking about how important sin is, uh, how important it is for us to realize what sin is, I should say. Uh, he talks about the very immoral son, uh, the very immoral type person who is easily, easily seen as sinful. He talks about the more moral type person who also falls short of the glory of God. But he doesn't stop there. He talks about the very religious person and how even with the all kinds of religion, they still fall short uh, of being as perfect and holy as God is. Each one of us has a sin problem, and, and, and Paul talks about the importance for us all to be cleansed. And, and that's uh, a message I did called Laundry Day, where we all need to be brought in. Now, uh, last week, uh, or the last couple weeks, he, he really talked about the importance of faith in Christ, that saving faith in Christ. Uh, and last week's message, he used two examples. He used Abraham, who uh, was found faithful um, by putting his faith in the Lord, and he lived 600 years before the law was given. Uh, he gave a second example in the passages for this in, um, in um, Romans 4, 1 through 8. Uh, and he talked about how uh, David, uh, David would have been judged under the law for what happened with Bathsheba and the killing of her husband, uh, the murder of her husband by David. Uh, he there would have been no way to cleanse him. 
So under the law, David would have been found guilty. So how was he forgiven? He was forgiven uh, by having faith that God for, could make a sacrifice, that God could forgive him. Even though there was no way under the law he could be forgiven. Both Abraham and David, uh, Paul surmises, had to have been saved by faith. And, and he shows in Scripture, uh, it is Genesis 15, 6, uh, where in, even in Genesis it says that Abraham's faith uh, in God was counted as righteousness. So uh, Paul is saying for us, putting our faith in Jesus uh, to save us, what he did at the cross, is nothing new for the Lord. The Lord has always required us to trust him for our forgiveness and salvation. It is not gained by our works or our actions. Even though the Jews felt like the, the work of Abraham is, is what had helped them. I think if you look through this story, it's really the word of God directing Abraham that helped them. It was the work of God, but it was seen in the faithful life of Abraham. And, and that's where we are today. Uh, Paul is going to continue to kind of talk to them about uh, how they think that their religious acts have helped them. And really, it's the religious acts should be seen as them being faithful to what God has commanded, that God has helped them. But, but they want to take credit. And it's really the downfall for all of us. I think all of us in some way want to take credit for our righteousness and faith when, when that is really all of our salvation is the work of the Lord. So I'm going to read through this. It's kind of a long passage, uh, Romans 4, 9 through 25. I'm going to come back and make three points and then jump over to illustrate those points uh, briefly in Mark. Okay, so here we go. Romans 4, 9 through 25. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Now I'm going to stop there, and you can see on your screen, that's, that's my first break. I, I, I'm going to summarize this for you. <laughs> briefly. Uh, the, the Jewish people thought circumcision set them uh, aside as God's chosen people. And if they had that, they didn't have to do any more. If, if the Jewish men were circumcised, they were righteous just by that act. Now, that, that's like saying if you've been baptized, uh, you're guaranteed to get into heaven. Listen, if you've had a water baptism or were sprinkled as a child, that does not guarantee anything. Because the Lord can see the faith in your heart. Now I'm going to illustrate that in those passages in Mark in a bit, but, but what Paul really drives home here is he said, you know, Abraham was already in Genesis 15, 6, uh, considered righteous by the Lord. His faith was already made him righteous. He had already followed the Lord. And, and the, the covenant of circumcision wasn't given until Genesis 17, 5. So how? Over, over these 13 to 24 years between these two passages, when Abraham was already called righteous but not yet circumcised, how did circumcision then make him righteous? It didn't. It was simply a, a marker showing that God had already considered him that way, that God had already set his people apart. Matter of fact, throughout other scriptures uh, in the New Testament that, and in the Old Testament and Isaiah as well, it talks about circumcising your heart, uh, removing anything blocking you from truly loving the Lord. Uh, it was an outward symbol of something that had already happened on, on the inside. And, and that's exactly what Paul calls it. He refers to it as a sign. And, and the thing about signs, if you think of them, a sign is something along the road or somewhere that points to something else. A sign tells you something else. And, and Paul in other places says, you know, uh, it, it, depending on that, if the sign doesn't really point to your salvation in Christ, your faith in him, 
th then it's a lie and it actually condemns you. If, if you're driving down the road and you're running low on gas and you see a sign that says uh, five miles to the next gas station and you look down and you say, okay, I'm, I'm 25 miles to empty, I'm going to make it. And then it takes 30 miles to get to the, that station. Are you going to think that sign was helpful or are you going to curse that sign? You, you may curse it because you may well wind up five miles short of getting gas. Uh, that's the thing that the symbol on the outside without any meaning in your life only becomes a, a curse. And, and he starts off talking about the how much pride they put in this. And, and I've known over the years, people put pride in, well, my parents were, were Christians, so that doesn't save you. Or we, we give to the church every week, that doesn't save you. And I'm not saying don't give, and I'm not saying don't be happy if your parents are Christians. And I, but, but I am saying you, you don't get in because you're a good person, because you have great intentions, because uh, you, your parents are Christian. You, you don't get in because you walked down the aisle once. You don't get into heaven because you were baptized or water baptized or water baptized three times forward. You get into heaven only for your faith in Christ. And, and Paul is saying, listen, if, if circumcision doesn't get you in, what gets you in? He, he talks about the timing that, that Abraham was, was given this when he was an old man. After he had already been faithful. I like the order of this that Paul talks about. It puts it in context. The, the outward things we do for the Lord should show what's already changed on the inside. And the first thing he uses is this outward symbol of of circumcision. Second thing in verses 13 through 15, he uses a, another thing that people like to point to to get them in. They say they're good enough, they've lived a good enough life, they've followed certain laws. Verses 13 through 15 reads of Romans 4, it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are, are heirs, Faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now listen, he, he's almost making the point, if, if you were never given the law, <laughs> right, you'd almost be in better shape. Because you wouldn't be aware of your sin. But yet, the Lord gives us a conscience, and, and people are genuinely aware of falling short in their lives. Well, we have a conscience, and, and, and it is only made louder through the reading of the law, realizing that we don't follow his ways well. I mean, the, the number one law was do not worship any other gods before me. Don't put any other gods before me, right? Number one. And, and what was Moses doing when he brought the law? What were the people of Israel doing when Moses brought the law down? They were already worshiping a calf. He was so angry he broke them, had to go back. The number one thing in the list. They weren't doing number five. They weren't doing number seven. They, they were already fully exposed worshiping other gods while Moses was getting the law. How quickly we walk away to the Lord and depend on ourselves, depend on other things. Uh, I think something else might work. Uh, one of the things that uh, is very important is, is to learn to trust in the God. Not star charts, not... Uh, anything else but him and and the reality too is we don't trust our baptism we trust jesus to save us we don't trust our giving we trust jesus to save now those other things may well come out of our faithfulness because jesus asked us when we have put our faith and, and trust in him to enter those waters of baptism and show our full commitment to him he asked us when we come to know him to take communion. Why? Because then we're remembering his body and blood shared at Calvary. The, these are uh, opportunities for us to remember him, to remember where our faith came from, how it was established. It was established through him doing the work, and us doing the work of communion or baptism does not help us. There are merely ways we point to him. In baptism, we remember Jesus going into the grave and rising again. And, and we're putting into a real-life scenario 
uh, our ability to sense us going into the grave and being risen by him. Now, it, it means very little if you haven't put your trust in him, but if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, it means a great deal. And, and, and you can feel in your senses what, what you're trusting. But the act of it doesn't save you. It reminds you of how you've already been saved and you were saved by putting your faith in what Jesus did at the cross for your salvation, for your forgiveness. Abraham w received the opportunity to be circumcised and, and set apart by the Lord because he had already been found faithful. And if you think about it in those terms, Abraham was also the father of, of all those who are uncircumcised. Because he was faithful when he was uncircumcised. And he becomes the father of all those who are circumcised as a reminder that they should be faithful. And, and Israel isn't. And, and Paul is saying this to them. Anybody can be faithful. It's not about the outward sign. And, and they looked for it in circumcision and they looked for it and we were given the law well the law was to humble you you know in in nehemiah chapter 8 uh, they had built the wall and there was a celebration and in this celebration in nehemiah after they had built the wall around the city and the people were safe and nehemiah had completed his job uh, they brought out the law and they began reading it and the people began to weep because they realized how far short they had fallen of the lord and in that grief nehemiah says to them drink something sweet eat something rich because the, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And, and he was happy that the people were being repentant and putting their faith in the Lord. The, the thing is, they had violated the law and he was telling them that, that they can be joyous in, in knowing that God can forgive you when you have grief. And, and when you have grief about how far you've fallen short, you need to turn to Jesus. Because the law is there as a marker to show you that you need grace from God. Abraham didn't even have the law, by the way. It was given to Moses 600 years after Abraham. Abraham couldn't have been saved by it. And if you look at his story, he wasn't perfect under the law anyway. Even if he would have had it, it would have only highlighted all the more how far short he came. Now, Abraham was credited by being faithful to what the Lord asked him to do and the works the Lord gave him to do. Not by his own works, but by his faith in the Word of God. So there we get to verse 16. Romans 4, 16, I'll read through 25. I hope you have your Bible, you're following with me. And this is great because it starts with, therefore. And whenever you see a therefore or a but now in Scripture, a lot of times something good. He, he's painted the, the negative picture that outward acts and the law, they're not going to save you. So where do you turn? If it's not through your knowledge or your actions, how can you be saved? Paul tells us here, Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. See, it's not only to those who are circumcised or under the law or part of Israel. It's also to all those who have the faith that he had even before he was circumcised. Even back in his day when he didn't have the law. The opportunity to come to the Lord in faith has always been there for all. And Israel was selected and set apart to tell the world about how great God was and how they could come to the Lord in faith. And they always wanted it to be about our, their works. And you can criticize Israel, but we do the same thing. We want it to be about our works. Um, let me get back here. It says, uh, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. Not only those who are on the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Again, all. Jew, Gentile, all of us. His faith is an important uh, blessing for all of us to see. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be, without weakening in his faith. 
he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word it was credited the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit with righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is what we need to put our faith in. It, it, and it can't be in our acts. It can't be in being good enough or knowing enough about the law or knowing enough about religion or doing all the religious things. It must be in putting our faith in Jesus Christ, confessing our sins and, and turning to him and allowing him to be the king and leader of our lives. And, and I'll tell you what, you may think that, that uh, the Lord doesn't see faith. This is where I want to jump back to Mark and I want to show you three things. I, I shared it with the, the students last week at, at paintball camp and I think it was helpful. We were going through the miracles and, and I'll tell you this, Abraham saw miracles, right? Paul saw miracles. Uh, both of them were faithful. And, and when you put your faith, your full faith, and, and maybe you only have a little tiny bit. You say, Chris, Pastor Chris, I don't have much faith in Jesus. If you put a little faith in Jesus, he can show you amazing things. And he will grow your faith. He is the author and perfecter of your faith. It starts with putting a little bit in him. And he grows it. And that was his intention as he trained the disciples. And he, he put on display the, the power of God through miracles. And, and the first one is in Mark 2, uh, 1 through 12. It is Jesus' power over illness. I illustrated it uh, in uh, the paralyzed man with four of his friends bringing him to Jesus. And Jesus is teaching probably, most likely, in Peter's house. And, and some the Pharisees were in there with their arms crossed judging him for how he was teaching. And, and multitudes were around. And uh, in, in Mark 2, 1 through 12, there are are four guys that bring their friend. They probably get there late because they're carrying their friend on a mat, and he's paralyzed. And, and they badly want to get him to Jesus, but the crowd is around. And I don't know which of the friends devised this plan, but it's a great plan. One of them said, well, let's go up on top of the roof. It's a flat, like, clay or thatch roof, and let's dig through it and, and lower Jesus down to him so, so our friend can be healed. And so they get up on the roof in, in uh, Mark 2, verse 4, it says, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw, now I'm going to stop here for a second. What I said to the kids, don't you think Jesus would, it would be when Jesus saw the dirt falling in his head from the thatch, they would mix mud in. If, if it wasn't clay, they would mix mud in and it, and it was likely that kind of roof where there would have been mud and debris falling in if you start to rip off that kind of roof. And it, it, but it doesn't say Jesus looked up and saw the mud and dirt falling on him. It doesn't say he, he saw a man on a mat. It doesn't say he saw their faces and have a description. What does it say in, in Mark 2, 5? It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. You know what Jesus is always looking for? He's always been looking for faith. And, and here, we, we have it highlighted in Mark, exactly what Paul is explaining theologically in Romans, that God has always been looking for faith. And when he spoke to Abraham, Abraham did something. He was faithful to listening to what God was doing. These guys came up, they were bringing their friend to Jesus, and, and Jesus saw their faith. Okay, and... Let me give you another one. Uh, flip over to Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 40. And, and this is Jesus' power over nature. We were looking at, at the miracle of Jesus' power over nature. He calms the storm. The disciples are, are, are being sent across the lake. It's about a six-mile trip, and it's a night trip. So it's dark out. And, and they get out on the lake, and a storm comes up. And Jesus is asleep on a cushion. He's been working all day, working hard, teaching, healing, helping. And he's asleep. And they become worried. They're trying to get a, a cross under their own strength. And they're working and working. And 
Finally, they wake Jesus up and accuse him of not caring if they perished. I don't think it's a fair accusation. Actually, I know it isn't, because Jesus always cares. But in Mark 4, 40, uh, he, he says to them, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? He can see that they're, they're scared, and, and they were angry at him, and they, they thought he didn't care. And one of the things we need to do is we need to have faith in God that he wants to care for us, that he's going to make a path for us. At, at the end of this passage, it talks about how Abraham thought he was as good as dead at 100 years old. He thought his wife's womb was dead. And, and one thing you need to know is, is the uh, word Abram, his name, his original name, was father of many. Abram means father of many. Do you know how many children Abram had? He had zero. He had zero until he was 100 years old. And so when somebody would meet him and he'd say, well, my name is Abram, they'd say, how many children do you have? And he would say, I have none. And, and Jesus, or Jesus, the Lord changes his name. Changes his name to Abraham. And Abraham means father of many nations. And Abraham may have felt like maybe God is making fun of me. Because Abraham at 100 years old, as good as dead for the promise of being a, a, a father of many, let alone a father of many nations. But God was at work. And God was going to do the work that Abraham could never do. No man, no doctor, nobody at that time, probably nobody now, could have a couple at this age conceive. Only God can do what we cannot do. And only God can do things. It, it, the fact that only he can do it means we have to have faith in him that he'll do it. And you can see through these miracles, that the Lord Jesus is looking for faith. If He doesn't see it in his disciples, and he wants to. He, he sees it in the four friends that bring their paralyzed friend. But I want to tell you uh, the, the amazing one. And it's in Mark chapter 5. And in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43, there, there is a, a rabbi. And when Jesus crosses back over the lake, he comes into Capernaum, it's kind of his home ministry area. Th this rabbi who maybe had ignored him before and you know, the rabbis had been giving Jesus a hard time. Who were you to, to forgive sins? And, and you're blasphemous. And, and they wanted to find a way to, to stone him, to get rid of him. Because so many thousands of people were flocking to him and listening to his teaching. He was a bigger draw than them. And, and they were jealous and they were angry. And, and Jesus crosses over and a, and a rabbi who probably otherwise would have been afraid uh, the head of the local synagogue had, would have been afraid to follow him or 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 show up for him he he suddenly comes out let me read some of this to you this is mark 5 21 it says when jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the sea one of the synagogue leaders named jairus came and when he saw jesus he fell at his feet and he kept begging him my little daughter is at death's door come and lay your hands on her so she can get well again and Jesus went with him, and a large crowd was following and pressing in on him. I'm going to skip down to 35 to stay with this specific story. It says, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Now listen, I, I love the way Jairus comes to Jesus. He doesn't come and say, I've followed the law. He doesn't come and say, I'm circumcised. He comes and he begs, please help my daughter he puts his faith in and remember jesus can see faith in people he can see the disciples lack of faith when they were scared about him sleeping on the sea that he may not care and, and you know jesus cared about them. It, you can see when when the the paralyzed man is lowered by his friends jesus looks up he doesn't see the dirt he doesn't see anything else he sees faithful friends he sees people being faithful that they believe jesus can help and what are they being faith? They're believing in Jesus to do something that none of them can do. They've come to the end of themselves, and they have to trust in Christ. And that's what Paul is talking about here. Saving faith is something we cannot do on our own. We can't do it through our righteousness. We can't do it through a mark on our body. We can't do it by following the law or knowing enough of the law. We can't do it by being good enough on our own. We need to ask the Lord for help. And the help comes in the form of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for us. 
Jesus is our help. Jesus is the one we cry out to to save us. Lord Jesus, save me. And that's what this rabbi did. And he did it at the cost of risking all that he had. Abraham had to leave the area and he was supposed to leave his hometown where he grew up and go to Canaan, go to the promised land and take possession of it. He was supposed to leave everything behind. And then God was going to do what only God could do and make him a great nation. And Abraham could never have done that, could never have understood that. So all he could do is put his faith that in the Lord that the Lord was doing something. Listen, you could never save yourself, but if you put your faith in the Lord, he will save you. And that's the only way we're saved. It's not by any of your works. It's not by how much you know. It's not by how many seminary degrees I get. And I'm not going to have any special standing in heaven. Matter of fact, when I am, am at the judgment, you know what I'm going to have to do? The same as every other person. I'm, I'm not going to be able to say, well, I was a pastor. I saw all these people saved. I did all this education. I did this, this. I'm not going to be able to say all that. I'm going to do the same thing every other sinner does. I'm going to point to Jesus and I'm going to say, I knew him. He is my righteousness. He, I believe in Him. I put my faith in Him. I put my faith in what Jesus did at the cross for me. Ask Him. And Jesus will say, I knew Chris. Does He know you? Have you given yourself to Him? We are saved by faith and faith alone. It's not works that anyone would boast. I want to finish this story though here in Mark. It's a special one to me. They come out and they say, why bother the teacher? He's not bothering the teacher. Jesus wants to help and he loves us. And we're never bothering him, especially when we ask for, for the amazing. Verse 36 of Mark 5. Overhearing what they said, Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. Just believe. That's how you're saved. You're saved by faith. Jesus doesn't say, hey, I'll make a deal. Get your buddies to stop being so mean to me. Jesus doesn't say, well, you've been circumcised, you've followed the law. No, that's not what Jesus said. What Jesus says to this man who is begging him for help, overhearing that his daughter is dead, Jesus says, don't be afraid, put your faith in me. Just believe. And, and Jesus didn't let anybody follow him except Peter, James, and John. They were the witnesses. They were the same witnesses that were at the transfiguration, that were with him as he prayed in the garden. They were the witnesses. Verse 38, when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. They had hired mourners because she was dead. Verse 39, he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. They laughed at him. They didn't put their faith in him. And Jesus can see, remember, when people put faith and when they don't. And he had encouraged this rabbi to put his faith in Jesus, not in the law, not in circumcision, but in him. They laughed at him. Very next line, after he put them all out. Listen, if you want to mock Jesus, you want to laugh at him, he will put you out. You will not see the miracle. He took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was, and he took her by the hand, and he said to her, little lamb, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And they were completely astonished. Jesus cast demons out of Gentile. He, uh, Gentiles, he here raised the dead. He did amazing things for, for both Jews and Gentiles. And in this situation, he does it for a Jewish rabbi. But, but he never, he does not highlight his circumcision. He, he does not highlight the law. What Jesus says is, have faith in me. And, and Jesus clears the room of anybody who would laugh, anybody who mocked. And, and the mother and father come in. The people who needed to put their faith in Jesus came in and saw what Jesus can do. Only Jesus can do. The Lord can only do certain things. <laughs> the impossible. And, and the, the amazing thing is that God always keeps His Word. It, if the Lord has said that we must put our faith in Christ, that we can only come to the Father through the Son. He's going to keep His word, and we should do it. Faith always takes God's side on the things God says. 
it's an important task to put our faith in the words of God. That's why I teach Scripture. That's why I tell you Scripture. That's why Paul gives us this Scripture. Because he wanted us to know that, that for as much faith as the Jewish people put into the works of Abraham, it had nothing to do with the works of Abraham. It had everything to do with the work of God and the Word of God and the faith Abraham put in God's Word. Because legalistic human effort never gets us where we need to be. Jesus looks for faith. And he did it throughout his earthly ministry. And Paul is attesting that this is the way God has always worked. He's doing the work. He's putting things together. Our work won't get us there. You know, Noah may have built the ark, but God gave him the instruction. God gave him the vision. And God sealed the ark to make it work. I don't know what the ark looked like. That, that family had never, Noah had never built another ark before. I don't know how seaworthy it was. I don't know how perfect it was. But I know he was faithful and God did what he did for him by sealing, by making it watertight, by taking him through the rain. Because God had given him his word. God has given us his word his son and we need to follow him my friend don't trust anything else except jesus for your salvation he's the miracle worker he always has been promises of god are all fulfilled in christ jesus is the object of all of our hopes what faith you have put in him, and he will save you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time, and Lord, I just thank you that Jesus looked for faith, and he's still looking for it. Your word is what is always saved, and your word was made perfect through Jesus. Help us to look to the cross to see our salvation. Help us, Father, to uh, come to saving knowledge of Christ through faith and not credit our works. If we do works, Father, let them exclaim the faith that's already alive in us, that's already saved us. If we are baptized, Lord, uh, help it to be that we are just declaring what Jesus has already done for us through faith. If we take communion, Father, impress on our hearts that it is there, to represent what Jesus gave us at the cross in His work. Lord, You've done all the work. All You've asked is that we put our faith and trust in You. And it's hard, Father, because we want to trust ourselves. But just like this man with his daughter, when we get to the end of ourselves and there's something that, that we can't do, we will come to You. And Father, I, I'm thankful that this man loved his daughter so much he was willing to risk everything to put his faith in you. Father, I pray today somebody might watch this and, and maybe they've been caught up in, 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 um, in, in uh, outward acts or in learning the law, and, and today they would be free to know that putting the faith in, in what Jesus Christ did at the cross is what really matters. Father, for anyone who may be embarrassed to talk about you at work because they haven't seemed so righteous under the law or they haven't uh, seemed so wonderful with all the, the hallmarks of, of maybe growing up a Christian kid or being a church or knowing what's right to say. Father, none of that matters. All that matters is that, that we put our faith and hope in Jesus and we trust you for our salvation. Father, help each person to talk about how great you are. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for Paul's words here to encourage and correct. I thank you that we have the ability to look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of the faith, and realize Paul is saying what's true. Jesus has always been looking for faith. Help us to give him something to look at today by putting whatever amount of faith we have in him. In Jesus' precious name, amen.
my friends, that's all I have. If I had more, I would share it. I hope if you're in, you're in the area, you can come out to Journey. I would love to see you, uh, get to know you, and encourage you in person. Uh, with all that being said, I hope to see you soon.